All right. Welcome, everyone, um, to our first uh, CCCOER webinar of 2018. Um, and this is Una Daly, the director of the Community College Consortium for OER at the Open Education Consortium. And we're thrilled to have um, folks from Monroe Community College with us uh, today to talk about uh, the OER initiatives um, at Monroe Community College and also some highlights uh, around uh, what SUNY is doing because I think all of us know a little bit about uh, uh, the opportunity that actually the whole state of New York uh, recently received and um, uh, our speakers will talk about that uh, in some detail. So our agenda today is uh, we're just going to give you a quick overview on some of the CCCOER activities that are coming up. And uh, then we're going to jump right into hearing about what's happening at Monroe Community College and in the larger uh, SUNY, uh, which is the State University of New York system, for those of you who might be new to that. And um, let's meet our speakers. So first, I'd like to introduce uh, Katie Gadu, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Katie. She is the Dean of Library Services at Monroe Community College uh, within the SUNY system. Would you like to say hello, Katie? Sure, hi everyone. I'm, and I'm actually the Director of Library Services. We're, we're not um, called deans here, but um, I'm happy to be here and, um, and to answer any questions people have and share what we're doing. Thanks so much, Katie, and I'll, I'll correct the slides before we... Oh, thank you. I should have caught that. <laughs> Wonderful. And we also have Dr. Rolo Fisher, who is the Choral Director and Instructor at Monroe Community College. Yes, uh, it's Dr. Rolo Fisher, yes. And I do um, uh, the Choral Directing as well as some of the other vocal techniques classes and other classes related to our music majors. Wonderful. And I hear you've been doing some OER work. Yes, so uh, I'll speak more about it later, but uh, I have done uh, OER for a voice class for non-majors, and I'm currently, uh, this next summer, going to be developing an OER for a class sequence that we offer, which is called Oral Skills from one through four. Wonderful, and I hope we, I hope we have some choral instructors on. Uh, we'll make sure that we uh, get this recording out to widely out to our members and colleges so that they can share this as well. So for those of you who might be new to the Community College Consortium for OER, we are celebrating our 10 year anniversary uh, this year. Um, and our mission um, hasn't really changed uh, since we were founded, um, although many of the strategies um, and the technology and uh, best practices have moved along. But basically, it's about expanding awareness and access to high quality open educational resources. Um, we support faculty choice and development. These, professional, these webinars are part of that professional development that we offer, and ultimately, it's about improving student success and how we can support faculty in, in that endeavor. Um, quick um, update on our membership map. Um, in December, we had to change up our map um, to include Hawaii, and um, we're, we're sort of still working on this, um, but now um, we have Hawaii, which we're just thrilled. The University of Hawaii Community College System joined us in December, along with a number of other uh, wonderful colleges. You can find this information at our, uh, at our website under members if you want to get the full list. Um, but um, it's really wonderful to see this growth uh, throughout um, the United States and, in fact, in North America. We have Canadian members who uh, work with us as well. So a really big event for us, a big annual online event, is the Open Education Week. And it's generally, it, well, it's, it's, this is, I think we're entering our sixth year. Uh, it's always in March, and generally it's the first week of March, and it, and it is again this year. Um, and it's an opportunity for you to create awareness on your campus around open education. We have a lot of uh, posters you can download from this website. My parent organization runs this. Um, but of course, we at the community college also participate um, in it uh, to a large extent. Um, so you can download 
um, things you can post, uh, webinars that are occurring and share those with folks at your campus. Um, you can also showcase your materials to a global audience. So you can go up there to that website and do a submit, submit those resources. If you want to provide webinars during that uh, week uh, that you want to share around the world, um, you can also post those there uh, along with the links so that people can get in and these resources will stay up for an entire year. So we get people all over the world, um, lots, lots and lots of participation each year, it, it keeps growing. So we hope that uh, you'll join us in uh, whatever capacity makes sense at your institution. Um, I'd like to mention the Open Education Global Conference. This is um, an amazing opportunity to meet people from around the world who are involved in open education on a face-to-face -face basis. Um, so if you get a taste from uh, Open Ed Week, you might want to join us for one of these global conferences uh, this year in the Netherlands. Uh, it's in Delft in April um, or maybe in, in an upcoming year. And the way this works is that the Open Education Consortium has members in over 49 countries. And um, our members submit in a competitive application to host this conference each year. And so it moves each year country to country. Uh, last year it was in South Africa. Um, and um, this year it's in the Netherlands. And um, next year it's gonna be on another continent. I can't mention that uh, name yet because it will be announced at the conference. But it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity to meet educators around the world who are focused on um, broadening open education and expanding access. All right, um, enough about CCCO, CCCOER and OEC. Now I wanna to move towards, um, towards our SUNY presentation. And I, I just, um, I was trying to figure out kind of an overview slide here to talk about New York. Um, and um, naturally SUNY is the focus of today, but um, both SUNY and CUNY, which are, or sometimes I hear it pronounced, um, CUNY. So I'm not, I'm not sure which is the appropriate uh, pronunciation for that, but that is the City University of New York system. They each received $4 million back in the spring, or that it was announced in the spring that uh, the governor, uh, the state legislature of New York was providing that money for developing open educational resources, programs, practices, policies uh, throughout uh, both systems um, and the grant f was the what, what is called the performance period of the grant was one year and I believe that started July 1st and so those of us in the open education field were so excited to hear about this uh, about this opportunity for um, the CUNY and SUNY systems and I know that I've I've attended a few conferences, um, I've had phone calls with some folks, and heard about the great stuff that's happening in New York and um, how you're putting that money to good work uh, for your students. And so um, I'm so very pleased to have Monroe Community College, who is one of the leaders in this area, uh, come and tell us about not only does their work, but um, Katie is gonna kind of set the framework for what's happening in SUNY overall, and then um, dive down into uh, what's happening at Monroe, and then we have the pleasure of hearing from Dr. Rollo Fisher about what he's doing as part of that program. So I'm gonna turn this over to um, Katie now, who is, oh, I got it correct on this slide, Katie, the Director of <laughs> Library Services. Um, and if you wanna ask me for the, yes, wonderful, for the keyboard, you can move your own slides. Yeah, you do have it correct. So I think I just didn't catch it on the first one. I'm sorry about that. Um, let me just make sure I can move forward. Should be at the bottom of your screen, the arrows. There you go. If you click on that. Perfect. Okay. Yep, thank you. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm the library director at Monroe Community College and on our campus, um, the library's taken a pretty large role in supporting OER and supporting our wonderful faculty who are choosing to use OER. Um, but we're just one of 64 campuses in SUNY, so the State University of New York, and I have a picture up here. Um, and for those of, of you who aren't familiar, um, those 64 institutions range from you know university centers to comprehensive colleges to technology colleges and community college 
colleges and we're one of the latter. Um, and it's all over New York State, so we actually have, um, we're not as far apart as, say, the California system, but there is some distance between us. And as um, Una mentioned, last, uh, last year it was announced that New York State, um, the New York State budget was going to fund $8 million to support OER initiatives, and half of that was going to go to SUNY. Um, the focus was going to be on high enrollment general education courses, but what was interesting is that um, when the money came to uh, SUNY, they decided to split it up and give each campus a certain allotment, um, and then each campus could really determine how they wanted to use that funding. So how Monroe chose to use it might be um, different than how another college chose to use that funding. Um, but the basics were that any college who wanted to be involved um, received uh, a baseline of $20,000 to work with, and then you received additional funding for each student enrolled in an online, or in, in, not online, in an OER course over the year. Um, and you can see there's a little bit of an incentive if all sections of a course were OER. Um, so each campus ended up with a slightly different amount of funding to work with. Um, and then the requirements were that each campus who wanted to be part of this um, had to develop a model, a sustainability model. So when the um, funding went away, how are we going to be able to sustain the work? Um, and that the funding should be used to help existing or new OER initiatives on the campus. So again, um, it was up to the, the campus to determine how they wanted to use it. And what was interesting is that, um, I guess I'll leave this slide up here for a minute. Um, I think we all know what open educational resources are, um, but we found that different states maybe will use a different um, definition for what an OER course is. And so we use the standard um, Hewlett OER definition, so teaching, learning, and research resources that reside in the public domain or have been released under an intellectual property license that permits repurposing by others. But what New York State did is that um, any course that uses a majority of materials, um, a majority of OER materials could be called an OER course or section. And so that's what's different than um, some other initiatives we've been a part of, that not everything in an OER course has to be OER. And um, kind of the number one question we got when we started implementing it was, what does the majority mean? Um, and, and so uh, what it means is that at least 51% of the content in that course is openly licensed or in the public domain. And that the other 49% could be made up, made up of, um, it could be made up of OER, it could be made up of library resources, copyrighted materials, um, ancillary materials. Um, and what we found is that um, a lot of, um, at least on our campus, a lot of people are the goal is to go 100% OER, but there might be something that they can't find a great OER alternative for. So maybe it's a um, maybe it's something that they use for a lab, or um, they want to incorporate some library resources. And so having that wiggle room made it um, made it much easier to adopt OER. And again, this is the um, these are the requirements from SUNY. But beyond that, each campus could decide for themselves any additional restrictions. So some campuses um, could decide that, you know, for their OER courses, they want 100% of it to be OER. Or some campuses could say, um, we want to say OER courses have a certain um, dollar limit, right? So um, we want to keep our OER courses under $30 per student or $50. And we're seeing different campuses choose different things across the state to best meet their needs. Um, at Monroe, we've kept with this definition for, um, for all of the courses that are using the funding from this grant. So at least 51% is using openly licensed materials.
And then again, just that one of the requirements was to develop a sustainability model. So um, at Monroe and at, at several of the other colleges, um, what they've done is they've voted and approved an OER course fee in classes where the content has been replaced by OER. Um, we have not actually implemented it because this funding from the state covers any, um, any costs in terms of um, time or paying for faculty development stipends or for the platform we're using. Um, fortunately, that grant money covers it for now, so we wouldn't actually implement, um, implement that until that funding goes away. And so the, the, major, um, the major player in New York State in supporting all of these campus is SUNY OER Services. And they grew out of um, SUNY OER textbooks. Um, and, and I'm sure many of you have heard of them before. And so um, what they did was um, started going around the state with a panel of faculty who have been using OER. And also um, they brought on some additional support. And so um, they brought on people from different campuses who have been using OER, supporting OER. So from Monroe, um, a group of librarians are part of um, a part of these workshops or a part of going around the state and offering support. But SUNY OER Services is really that centralized support for us and they partner with any vendors um, and, and the colleges just works through SUNY OER Services. And so this is a fairly um, recent number, but um, at the end of this one year academic period where the funding came through, about 56,000 SUNY students will have taken an OER course, so across the state. Um, and uh, in case you're wondering how many students are in SUNY, I, I didn't know that and had to look that up. But we have, the most recent count is that we have 1.3 million students, but only 600,000 of them are in credit bearing courses. So I think this would be out of those credit bearing courses, 56,000 of them, um, 56,000 students took an OER course. So almost, is that almost one sixth, if my math is correct? And then at the end of, over that same period, um, six and a half million dollars in textbook savings to students. So a four million dollar investment returned uh, six and a half million dollars in savings to students. So now I'm going to turn to what we're doing at Monroe, because um, I can get into the details a little bit more and share some specifics that might be more interesting or more um, uh, relatable. And so Monroe Community College, we're a community college in Rochester, New York. Um, in fall of 2017, we had um, just under 13,000 credit um, students taking four credit courses. But if you take a look at the slide, we have a much larger number of students um, taking a combination of credit and, and non-credit. We have a fairly robust workforce development um, program here at Monroe. And so the number of students walking through our doors is much more than the 13,000. In our, we've been working with OER for a number of years now. So it all started um, officially, or at least the, the first time that the library got involved with anything formal with OER is back in 2014, we received um, a technology grant that's internal to SUNY. Um, along with a few other community colleges. And the goal of that grant was to find one faculty member in one course on your campus who was willing to take, uh, to move from a traditional publisher textbook to OER. Um, and so what two wonderful faculty at Monroe did was took our college orientation course, um, which was, they were using a traditional publisher textbook. And I think there was also like a homework, um, a platform where students would do homework. It was about $144, and they ended up adapting um, an OER text that was out there um, and implementing it across all sections at MCC. And that was um, uh, Renee Domino and Terry Shamblin. And so over the past three years, um, over 6,000 students have taken that course, and um, 
you know, saved quite a bit of money for those students in their first, um, their first course at MCC. And then after that, we applied for the Achieving the Dream um, OER degree initiative and um, partnered with some really great faculty. I think we have 19 different faculty who are working on this degree. Um, and it's a liberal arts biology is the program that the degree is in. But, um, you know, we have faculty and courses from all over the campus who are developing open courses as part of that degree program. And so what this did is when the New York State SUNY funding came along, um, we found that we were really well positioned to um, jump right in full steam. And some of the things, you know, we had done prior to receiving that funding um, that set us up so well is, you know, things that many of you are already doing. Um, but we applied for grants, like Achieving the Dream. Um, we found those faculty champions, and I'm glad uh, you're going to be able to hear from one in just a little bit. Because um, we found that, you know, uh, OER can be kind of a big thing to think about when you're used to using a traditional textbook and having someone maybe in your department or on your campus who can, um, who's another faculty member that can talk about it um, is much more impactful than um, someone from the library talking about it. Um, you know, initially before SUNY OER services was around, we used part of our library budget to partner with Lumen Learning. Um, we found we had to bring on um, additional support in the library, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, and then connect with key stakeholders across campus, and again, we worked on our sustainability model. And so when this money came in, the New York State SUNY OER initiative, um, the main chunk of it, we knew we wanted to use that money for faculty, um, to support faculty because they were the ones doing all the work. Um, and we found from the Achieving the Dream grant that it was a lot of work to adopt, adapt, or create OER. Um, and again, this is just what we did on our campus. Each SUNY campus could do something different. Um, so we put out a call for applications and faculty members could, um, could apply and choose either release time during the semester or a summer stipend. Um, to do the work on those those courses and um, we base the funding on the credits of the course so a three credit course would receive more or a faculty member redesigning a three credit course um, to use OER would receive more than a one credit course and we didn't have different tiers of funding um, I know I've seen other colleges that maybe um, there's a certain stipend to adopt, a certain stipend to adapt OER, and another one to create. Um, we just went with straight across the board the same amount. Um, for anyone adopting, adapting, or creating OER for the first time at Monroe. So if it was a course that had never um, used OER before. Um, and the preference went to courses with high textbook costs and or where all sections would move to OER. And so we have 16 faculty um, who were funded through this initial round of funding, and we're going to do another one this spring. Um, and then the other thing we did with that money is bring on someone to help us out, um, because we're finding that the, the more OER scales up, the harder it is to support it with someone who's dedicating part of their time. Um, to supporting it. And um, she's actually on the call. Michelle Beachy is our wonderful, you know, grant project manager slash OER um, librarian slash um, fix it person. Um, so she, so part of that SUNY OER funding at our campus goes to have Michelle there. Um, and so she is, you know, one main point of contact for all of the various people involved in OER across campus. Um, she maintains our grant budget and makes sure that we're on track and we're, you know, faculty are getting their release time or stipends. Um, she also helps out with our Achieving the Dream uh, grant with all of the campuses who are part of that. So SUNY had five different campuses who were awarded the Achieving the Dream grant and we're all working together. Um, those other campuses, in case anyone's on, it's, um, Tompkins Cortland Community College, Herkimer Community College, Mohawk Valley Community College, and Clinton Community College. 
Um, and then Michelle also facilitated that faculty application process and is, is the main point person for um, all those faculty who are starting to develop using this money. And we found that this, um, it, at first it was a little bit of a hard sell on our campus that we, um, that one that we needed someone full time to just support OER and that it couldn't just be someone part time. Um, but we found that uh, more and more people are getting interested and it really is, we've been able to do so much more once we've had Michelle here. Um, so we've done some campus-wide professional development on our own and I'm not gonna um, you know, delve, in it to it, delve into it too much. Um, but the main thing we've done is partner with SUNY OER Services. They've come to our campus and done a couple of different workshops. Um, they're who we work with um, to make the, the OER available to other people. Um, and they, they're who we work through. Um, they partner with Lumen Learning, so they're kind of our pass through to Lumen Learning, um, but so much more. And then another interesting thing we did was, um, you'll see the icon for OER FIG, and that stands for OER Faculty Inquiry Group. And one of our librarians, Andrea Kingston, um, started a year long inquiry group um, for faculty interested in OER. So they would meet monthly um, and talk about the courses they were working on and share tips. Um, we bring back information we got at conferences um, and, and things like that. And then another interesting thing we were able to do with um, the additional support is we took a process that is used for developing online courses at MCC um, and applied it to OER. So we're really fortunate that um, we have a really robust um, support system for online course development. It's run out of our virtual campus. Um, and every faculty member who's developing a new online course gets assigned an instructional designer, a librarian, and a multimedia specialist, and they all work together um, to look at the course learning outcomes and objectives and really design a course for that's meant for online. Um, and so what we did is kind of adopted and adapted that process for OER. So every faculty member who's, um, who is working with OER gets assigned a librarian. Um, we also have an instructional designer that works with making sure everything's available in Blackboard, which is our course management system. Um, and we also, um, if, if needed, work with one of our great multimedia specialists for any, um, any multimedia needs. Um, we've also found by having this extra support, we can provide a lot of individual support for faculty. And again, I mean, many of you have probably heard that or found yourselves that um, it can vary depending on what the needs for that particular course is. Um, but everything from one-on-one -on -one consultations to analyzing a lab manual for what is, you know, individual or original content, um, what is copyrighted and what might be open, and then helping find replacements. Um, and then the one that we actually find um, that we spend a lot of time on is just um, moral support when there's those inevitable low points in the development process. Um, and, and just rem reminders of what's going on in the wider OER world and that everyone goes through kind of these peaks and valleys in the development, um, but that overall OER is really growing and there are a lot of exciting things happening. Um, so one of Michelle's um, other things that Michelle does is she really coordinates our OER distribu distribution. So at Monroe, we want to provide an optional print copy of um, OER textbooks if the faculty member chooses to offer it. Um, so we have an in-house print shop and bookstore and so we partner with them to get print copies made if we want or if the faculty member wants and to have them sold in the bookstore. Um, as I mentioned before all of our content is incorporated right into Blackboard um, and also made it available through SUNY OER services. And then just recently we've added um, uh, designation in our online course catalog and there's an image in the bottom right of the slide 
where students who are searching for courses or classes for upcoming semesters can check the open educational resources box and um, they'll come up with a list of all the courses that are using OER. And that's been really helpful in getting um, the word out to students and helping make sure that OER is available to them. And then I think the last thing I wanted to show was just a couple of examples of how we've been able to incorporate students at MCC. And actually Rallo has um, a great example of how he's incorporated students into his OER course. Um, but the two things I wanted to share were, um, we worked with a graphic design student last year. Um, she received course credit to develop um, textbook covers. And so you're gonna see some of her work on the left side of the screen. Um, she worked with the faculty who did want to offer, you know, a print copy and talked to them and designed a textbook cover. It's openly licensed. She received credit. Um, and it worked so well that we actually ended up hiring her with some of that um, SUNY funding. So all of her work is openly licensed. Um, we're making it available. And it's a, a cool, ex um, it's a cool example of what we've been able to do with students. Um, and I saw I just had a question come in. So if all content is in Blackboard, what does Lumen provide? Um, so we use the Lumen platform for editing OER content. So um, for example, our chemistry faculty use the OpenStax um, chemistry textbook, but they wanted to edit a lot of that content. So SUNY OER services pulls that content into the Lumen platform. Um, and then our faculty are given the ability to edit it. Um, and then also Lumen provides a, I think this is the right terminology, a course cartridge um, or an LTI integration. I apologize if anyone's um, really familiar with that and I'm butchering what it's called. Um, so that, that uh, live textbook is available right in the Blackboard course. And whenever a faculty member edits something, say they find an error or um, wanted to add something, it, you know, um, it's available right in Blackboard, you know, right away. So our students are really familiar with Blackboard, um, but they don't have access to it after they graduate. So we wanna make sure that the content is also available outside of Blackboard. Um, and then on the right, you'll see some examples of student testimonials that we, we grabbed from students. So I see I'm getting a couple questions, but I actually want to turn it over to Rollo right now just to make sure that we have enough time and then we'll be able to answer any questions that you all have for us, um, you know, at the end. So right. I will pass it over to you. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, and um, Rolo, um, can you, do, would you like to ask me for um, permission to use the keyboard or I can move the, the, um, the slides for you? It's up to you. You, you can move the slides. I'm, I'm basically going to just speak a little bit about how it all, my experience has been with OER. And oh, okay. Uh, Wonderful. So my name is Dr. Rollo Fisher, and again, I'm a choral and vocal instructor here at Monroe Community College. And amongst the number of courses that I teach, since I've been here in 2009, I taught a class that was for non-majors that was a voice class. It was an in-person class. It used a particular textbook, which costs upwards of about $125, $140, so it kept on going up. And I found that a number of my students struggled with trying to find the funds to be able to purchase said textbook. And I would find many a student begging me for, you know, a, a different way that they could go through some of the material and, you know, they could, you know, just look at the library and that was fine. But it, it dawned on me about a year ago that, you know, I've been teaching voice for many years now. It would certainly serve students better if there was some kind of an open-ended resource for them. So I went looking and there weren't any. So that was when I started coming up with the idea to be able to create some for that class. Now to give you an idea of the types of things that uh, the class, the textbook had were 
things that had to do with some of the basics of singing. And so there were a lot of different pieces of material out there that are pretty common knowledge, but they were in a particular textbook. And so I went on the mission of creating my own OER resource. And I started by creating a system of chapters and lessons that were all written based, which also included uh, some materials that I just personally just put in my own words and I had taken some of my knowledge from many of the years and, and just created my own OER resource. After I created the textbook, I then wanted to make sure that I had some other type of means where they could have some more additional resources. And so the wonderful people here at the MCC Virtual Campus have a room of where you can go and you can video record yourself professionally creating different types of lectures. So then I went about to do that for each of the lessons that I created as part of the textbook. That was not this last summer, but the previous summer. And as I was tweaking that, that's when the Achieving the Dream OER funding came forward. So I, of course, applied. And I was able to take the fall semester that year to kind of tweak through my materials, make sure that uh, everything, all I's were dotted, T's were crossed, and all permissions were given correctly, and I wasn't stepping on anybody's toes. And then the spring of this last year, 2017, I actually took that same course and used it in a face-to-face -face course. So the shell, all the materials that were OER were available in a Blackboard shell for the students to access, but then there was also the additional face-to-face -face time where we could talk about some of the materials in there and do some more dive deep on their individual instructions about them. Fast forward, I then taught the same course in the fall and I had, um, in my mind, I wanted to be able to offer this course as an online component, which has not really ever been done to my knowledge at another institution in SUNY. And so uh, luckily this spring semester, just a couple weeks ago, the first online section of voice class is now available in SUNY. So because it's available at the MCC virtual campus, that means that it also gives access to anybody in the SUNY online system to be able to take the course. Uh, another benefit of this particular model, besides being OER, was the fact that uh, one of the, the detriments of doing a voice class instruction in person is the fact that you're doing a lot of group instruction. And one thing I wanted to do was to add more individualized components. And so now I'm able to, with the online section, do with some wonderful technology where the students can actually submit videos of their vocal instruction to me and I can give them more one-on-one -on -one coaching than just the assessments that I did in the group instruction format. So basically, one of the things that I found fascinating as I was going through the process of creating OER was just the simple fact that there are a lot of things that are able to be made in public domain that aren't necessarily in public domain at that time. As there's a, a, I personally knew there's a growing body of, of work out there that could then be utilized to create an open-ended resource for something like a music class. And so on top of that, what I have been exploring and that I'm going to be partnering, uh, doing another OER grant for the summer, is I also teach uh, an oral skills class. And what that is essentially is, if you don't know anything about music, is essentially the idea is a student can come in there and what they do is, thank you, uh, what they do is they essentially take and there are three major skills that they are learning. One is to be able to take a piece of music and be able to sing it back. Another skill that they're using is to be able to listen to some a simple piece of music and write it down. And then there are several different levels and building up of layers that could be done with that. I've been teaching the oral skills sequence here at MCC now for about six years. And when I started, of course, I was grandfathered in this glorious textbook with CD-ROM system that costs uh, about $175 in which all of the students then had to purchase. And it was one textbook for the sequence, but I found while I was going through the material for said textbook and some of the, of the materials that were along with it is that they really didn't fit with a community college or a public university. They're, they were much more tuned towards classes that either were meeting 
four times a week where we meet once a week. A lot of uh, universities will meet four times a week for oral skills. And then also that they were, there was a lot of, how shall I put it, uh, public trust in the fact that the people who were using the CD-ROM to write out the dictations uh, weren't collaborating with other people to just listen to it and figure it out. And so I found that as I was teaching the class more and more, I realized that, you know, there are a lot of things about the way that this particular textbook and other textbooks, I, I think I looked at about five or six different textbooks because of course I was sent them from various publishers in different places saying, please use our textbook. Uh, I found the same problems with all of them. And so one of the things I endeavored to want to do is to be able to design the system to where a student coming in may not necessarily necessarily be the highest level person who's had lots of years of music experience, but they really want to learn to be able to do this skill. And one of the things that I strongly believe is that some of the students that come in are coming in and this is maybe part of their program, but it's not their greatest interest. So one of the things that I do with that particular course is I give them the end game. If they, and I know this is not OER, but it's kind of relevant to how I'm going to present the last part of this. And that was essentially if this is a musician, a vocalist who really wants to become the next Rihanna and then Disney hires them for their next recording for the movie and they bring them down there. and They're in the recording studio and, and suddenly there's a piece of music in front of them and they're like, okay, take a look at it. Now we're ready to record. And they're like, but wait, we're, I want to listen to the recording of it. There isn't one. You're the first one. You can't listen to a recording because it doesn't exist yet. And so the incentive to be able to figure out this particular skill set was greatly increased by just making people realize exactly what the purpose of the skills were. And honestly, as I was looking through a lot of the textbook, that was not very clear. And so as I'm going to be designing my OER text for this four semester sequence, a lot of it is going to include a lot of the justifications for why a lot of this material is important as well as going through how it can build upon itself much easier than the, the textbook formats that I have experienced. Wow, that, uh, thank you so much, um, uh, Rolo, for sharing that. Um, I wanna take your oral skills class. <laughs> Is it gonna be Wonderful. online? <laughs> You never know. <laughs> there you go. Um, hmm. Wow. Um, I really want to thank uh, Dr. Fisher and uh, Katie for sharing this. Um, I'm I'm looking for questions out there, um, and um, from uh, from our uh, audience. Um, and there's so many areas I'd like to discuss a little more, uh, but I wanna give our audience a chance. Um, we did have a question from Juville at Central uh, Virginia Community College, and she asked if any of the lab manuals, and, and this would be the biology lab manuals, I assume, are available for adoption. And that's probably for you, Katie. Yes, so um, yes, they are. They are not all up um, publicly yet, um, many of our faculty are teaching with them for the first time this semester um, and so they want to run through them maybe once before making them public to the world. Um, but I think my email is up maybe in one of the later slides or if not I can put it in the chat um, and, and I'm happy to put, um, if, if you shoot me an email I can put you in contact with those faculty and, and um, I found they're very open to sharing it even before, you know, maybe they they feel like it's 100% uh, done. Thank you for that. We often get questions on our email list, and I know that uh, Katie and um, Michelle are both on that email list about lab manuals, so um, I, I think that would be great um, to, to have that shared. All right, we had a question here from Roya, and she uh, asks, a faculty I have met with have concerns that something in OER could be moved out of public domain and become obsolete. Um, is that even possible? Well, I think that's probably a librarian question, although I, uh, I could answer it, but I, I'd like to give it to Katie if she's okay with that. Yeah. Um, so if it could be moved out of public domain and become obsolete, 
I, I mean, I guess my answer is, um, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm reading it correctly, so I don't know. Well, if I you know, it's, it's a legal question and a okay. public domain has a legal, um, right. Ramification to it. Um, and it, it, you know, it, there are precedences around public domain that have changed over the years. There was a big change um, back in the late 1990s, which pushed out um, when oh. copyright expires for um, creative works uh, to something like 74 years after the death mm -hmm. of the author. Um, it, so... Um, I understand that. that will change and um, it, it, I mean, sorry, that could change in the future. Um, but I don't think um, things can be um, move out of public domain, but it's usually for things, newer things that are coming out could expire later. Mm -hmm. um, and and it maybe an even more important question, Roya, is about open openly licensed materials. So those are, are ones that have a Creative Commons license on them. And I'll, I'll let Katie correct me if I if I misspeak mm -hmm. here, um, but from once a material is licensed with a Creative Commons license, um, that's not revocable. Um, the the original copyright holder holds that copyright. They can modify and re-release it uh, without the open license, but the original material that was released under that license um, continues to be available under that license. Um, so it cannot be revoked from that specific instance. So I hope that helps. Um, I think so. And thank you for, I, I'm not sure why I wasn't, <laughs> I don't think I was reading it correctly, but um, that totally makes sense the way that you um, replied to it. Okay, um, and Nikki Stubbs from uh, the Technical College System of Georgia has a question and she asked about um, Lumen um, and did they help with ADA compliance of the content? Um, yes and no. So um, the, the Lumen platform um, is ADA compliant. So most of the content that we've been putting there, or faculty have been putting there. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, it works well with screen readers, it meets, you know, ADA compliance, and so in that way they are. Um, in terms of, um, like our multimedia content, and actually, Rallo, you might wanna jump in here, but Lumen didn't do that for us, so we needed to find a way especially with original content to make sure it was ADA compliant. Um, and I know you have some videos that uh, yes. you were so, working on. Yes, uh, so one of the things that's with the videos, uh, the original videos did not have all the closed captioning that were needed. And so then we had to go back and make sure that it became ADA compliant. And we did go through and uh, do that. And we have uh, one of our uh, one of our ASL professors here actually, I think, helped out with some of that as well. So it was very, uh, the, the process was not hard. It was a streamlined. And uh, thank you for uh, the shout out as well for the fascinating classes. And I actually have to run now to go do one. So I apologize for leaving a few minutes early, but if anybody has any other questions, I'll be happy to answer them via email. Um, my email is just rfisher, F-I-S-H-E-R, at Monroe CC. Dot edu and of course if that you don't find that then you can just look me up on the MCC webpage as well. Thank you so much Rolo for joining us today. Um, I think many of us would like to take some of your classes. <laughs> Those of us who are you know frustrated singers but uh, yeah <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. All right so we've we've um, we do have a few more questions um, for Katie um, and uh, and those and thank you Rolo for sharing your email address for um, questions that come after for him. So Katie, um, you, we have a question here from Paige at, uh, at, at, in Illinois um, and she is asking about the majority OER material option and does it still mandate that all the remaining materials be free or is, a or is there a cost or can there be a cost? Sure, so we um 
it's a little confusing right now because we're using uh, we're parts of various grants. So for the achieving the dream grant, everything has to be free and open. So in those particular courses, um, while they're running for the grant, they have to be free and and one hundred percent open. Um, and what I think you're asking about though is these the ones that are using the SUNY OER funding um, on our campus. Do they have to be free? And the answer is no. So we, um, for example, our chemistry 151 and 152 courses, um, those are chemistry for biology majors. Um, when it's not running as part of the Achieving the Dream grant, they're still gonna keep the OpenStax textbook um, and that will be free. Um, but they've been using a product called Sapling and they find that it's really beneficial for their students. I think it's about $35 a semester um, or in that range. And so um, under the New York State OER guidelines, they would they want to keep that. And so they're going from, um, I think it's about $175 textbook. So they're removing that cost and keeping the roughly $35 one. Um, Paige had another part to that question. She was asking about the process, um, the OER designation in your online course catalog and um, mm -hmm. what was the process in getting this to happen. And I just, I want to kind of set the, uh, a little bit of the context here. So um, Oregon, Washington, I'm sorry, is it Oregon? Yeah, I'm uh, Oregon, Washington, California, and Texas, hmm, I think I've got one state wrong there, ha has put that into state law that um, their um, higher ed institutions have to make that, uh, make students aware of courses that are um, OER or low cost, uh, or the textbooks are. And um, it, I don't think that's a state requirement for New York. You are correct. It is not a state requirement. Um, so we, and I found that this, you know, again, is different at every institution in SUNY. We, OER on our campus has really been working um, up from the grassroots level. So it's faculty who are interested um, in the library and, and um, you know, people who are interested in it on campus have come together to work on it. There's no, there hasn't been any mandate. So this kind of happened the same way, fairly organically. Um, uh, we started talking with our, um, you know, technology department on campus and our records and registration, record, registration and records, my apologies, um, on the logistics, but it just kind of grew organically that it was something that should happen. Um, our course catalog already had different features to allow students to search. Um, so they could already search for online courses. They could search for writing intensive courses. And so it was just um, a matter of adding one extra designation. I think the biggest issue we've seen um, so far is students haven't known about OER or haven't known how to find it. So um, we're really happy that this is in place um, moving forward. Yeah, thank you for that answer. And thank you for the question, um, Paige, because it is really uh, becoming um, a tool for marketing to students. Um, and um, we, I think we had one more question here and uh, from Heather uh, White and um, Heather is asking you about, um, are you, do you have a concern about applying OER, I think in a general sense to non openly licensed materials via your majority OER category? Yeah, yes and no. Um, so we thought a lot about how we wanted to present this to the campus and to the different groups on campus. So for students, um, in our experience from talking to students, what they really care about is the cost. And so we didn't get into the specifics, um, you know, what an OER course means, just that it's, you know, openly licensed, they're low or no cost. But with faculty, we really wanted to make sure that people had a good idea of what open is versus free versus um, you know other course materials they might want to use and i will say that that has been a challenge so um, making sure that people know the difference between an oer course and oer content um, so far 
I think because everything's um, funneling through the library and we have a great group of really knowledgeable librarians that um, it's been working well, but I can see the concern and we definitely want to make sure we're doing enough outreach on campus and professional development so that people are, are um, know the difference. Yeah, thank you for that one, Katie. And, and there are um, differences around uh, certainly different states, different colleges and how they define OER. And it, it does, it's potentially confusing. So um, I, bef I, I think we're still waiting on additional questions, but I did want to mention just a, um, that we actually have a second webinar this month. Normally we have one a month, uh, one of our, our, our uh, general purpose webinars, and we had the opportunity to have a second one this month in two weeks, um, which I'm really excited about. We're going to have Boyung Che um, from the Washington State Board of Community and Technical Colleges. They just finished a survey with 10,000 of their students on uh, affordability, uh, specifically on textbooks. And we also are going to have Robin Donaldson, um, who is the Director of Instructional Research and Member Services at Florida Virtual Campus. She is the one who has been running the Florida Textbook Affordability Survey for uh, Boy, I'm going to say it's at least the last um, six years. It might be more than that. And they do it every other year. Last year, I believe it was, they, inter they surveyed 22,000 students. The majority of which are, were community colleges, but not exclusively. It was also from their public universities. So this is going to be a great webinar if you need that kind of information about student affordability and their perceptions. And... We're here for additional questions, if um, anyone has any. And once again, I want to thank Katie so much uh, for joining us today. Um, uh, just an amazing overview of what um, Monroe Community College is doing and also SUNY, the bigger system. So thank you so much for that overview. And of course, thanks to Dr. Fisher, who had to um, take off to go teach. Um, and thank you to all of you who joined us today. Uh, we were pleased to hear all those questions. We know you were uh, really interested in this material as well. Um, we will be um, captioning this video and making it available probably within the next 48 hours. Um, that material gets posted on our website. We also send it out to everybody who's on our community email. So we hope that you share this with others who couldn't make it today. Right. Any last moment questions from anyone? All right, I'm going to um, go ahead and stop the recording and uh, we'll be online for a couple